and welcome everybody to another not theory talk from all over the world okay i'll hand it to you lou okay thank you uh just a moment there you can see that <clears throat> yeah good so this i think is more or less where we left off uh i was describing the uh, montour of parity bracket or i was about to i don't remember which but let's start here again there might be an overlap uh here's the usual bracket polynomial expansion and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at the knot and uh, and if the crossing is an odd crossing uh, then I'm going to make it into a node so for example here in the casino if you take a walk from this crossing you cross once twice three times and come back to where you started I'm counting classical crossings. So a crossing is odd if you meet in the trip, uh, starting from a given crossing, going around, uh, and coming back to where you started. If you go through an odd number of classical crossings, like the simpler trip was this one, going around like that, and I went through that one crossing. If you go through an odd number of crossings, then it's an odd crossing. So. I'm going to notify all of the odd crossings at once at the beginning. And I obtain a graph, which may have some classical crossings in it. And uh, for the classical crossings, I then expand by the bracket. In other words, I take the sum over all the states that can be obtained by smoothing on the remaining crossings after notifying all the odd crossings. And I get a polynomial generalization where I have polynomials multiplying graphs, a sum of polynomials times graphs. Each graph shall be reduced by a Rademeister 2 move in this way if, if such move is available. And I'm not allowing uh, increases, so this is just a simple reduction process, and you can check from the graphs that you have whether or not they can be reduced and what the reduction is. The result is an invariant. And I leave it to you as an exercise to check that that's an invariant and try it out on some things. For example, here's the Cascino knot, which we know is difficult to identify. And uh, every crossing is odd, as I was just checking. So all, cross, all nodes get notified, all vertices get notified. And now, you need to look at this and understand after examining it a bit that there are no further reductions available. And so this graph is the invariant. And that proves that the casino is non-trivial. Uh, there is an analogy here with um, what are called minors in graph theory. In graph theory, you say that a subgraph is a minor of another you say that a graph is a minor of another graph if it can be obtained by deletion and contraction of edges from the given graph and uh the uh bracket operations of smoothing one way or smoothing the other are the analogs of deletion and contraction so what you might say is that we have proved that this graph is a minor, uh, an unavoidable minor of the casino. It will occur in any version of the casino that you care to make up to Reitermeister moves on it, up to virtual moves on it. So this is a very efficient way to prove that the casino is indeed knotted, and in fact is proving it more generally than for the particular virtual knot, the casino, it's proving it for the flat version of the casino. Since if you want a flat invariant out of this, you need only take a equal to one. And of course, the loop value becomes minus two. 
and then you have a flat invariant. And again, if there are non-trivial graphs, if it's all non-trivial graph, then it's certainly working. So we've proved that the flat Kashino cannot be undone. And thereby, that was of some use to us last week because we said that that meant that no band passing could happen on the Kashino. But let's just look at it as an invariant and consider it. So I recommend that you try this out on some things and do the exercise. If you want to make sure about the Reitermeister move, the second Reitermeister move, then notice what it is in Gauss code. In Gauss code, you are going along and you have B and then you have A immediately, and then after a while you have B and then you have A immediately, or you're going along and you have B and then you have A, and then after a while you have A and then you have B. Uh, and in the Gauss code, that means you have two crossed chords um, like that. And, and these crossed chords um, are adjacent to one another at their ends. So if, if that occurs, then you have a Reutemeister 2 move. And then you can examine things like the Cascino diagram and see that Indeed, uh, there aren't any moves that you can do. Notice the orientations. And you can make other examples. For example, here is a, is a very odd uh, a Gauss diagram. Every chord is odd. And if you take a very odd Gauss diagram, uh, why then the this bracket will just be the graph, and and if there are no Reitermeister two moves on that graph, then that graph is irreducible, and so the graph itself will be the invariant of the flat knot. You can make things look a little more complicated by going from a Gauss diagram over to a some virtual diagram, but uh, but but as soon as you have somebody who's totally odd, then that's what you get. And uh, so we can make infinitely many very odd uh, not diagrams like this, very odd Gauss diagrams, and consequently infinitely many distinct flat virtuals, each with their own pass class, if we were talking about passing. Infinitely many distinct pass classes for virtual knots in that sense. So if I were going to go further with passing, I guess I would restrict myself to uh, virtual knots whose flat corresponding flat knots were trivial, and then worry about the pass classes there, because as you see, passing just doesn't have anything to do with non-trivial flats in this sense. Here's another example. Um, in this case, I have four odd crossings and one even. And so we're going to place nodes on these four and expand the bracket. Uh, and when you do that, you get two states, and one of them does reduce, and the other one doesn't. And then if you analyze what happens under the Z move, which remember was flanking crossings are allowed to be removed, or a flanking crossing can be placed on the other side of a crossing, then you see you need this as a, a further uh, kind of graphical move correspondingly, if you want to show that there is no Z equivalence to the unknot. And in this case, you can then see by using the same combinatorics that this example that we we're looking at is not Z equivalent to a classical knot. Nevertheless, it has Jones polynomial equal to one. And so the question of what virtual knots have Jones polynomial equal to one is wide open. And it would be nice to know more about that. Now here comes another uh, invariant and I call this one the affine index polynomial. And I do believe I am overlapping, right? Uh, we were talking about this last week, but that's all right. 
uh, let's look at this. Um, what I'm going to do now is that same philosophy of uh, examining what happens. Let's see if that, no. Uh, I, of examining what happens when I go around a loop and come back to where I started. Uh, only now I'm uh, not just counting the crossings that I meet, I'm counting them with sign. And I'm going to count them with signs in, in the following way. If I start with A and I go across, then uh, I will decrement uh, the label that I used according to a left encounter or increment it according to a right encounter. And if it's a virtual crossing, I won't do anything at all. So in this example here, uh, uh, I have done that labeling. I started with A here, zero, near crossing number A, and um, I decremented. And then I went through crossing number B and I incremented it back to zero. And then I incremented it up to one and then it got incremented up to two, and then it went back down to one, and so on, coming around to where I started. And you can check that it, you will always come back to zero if you started zero, and you could have labeled it starting anywhere because I'm only interested in the differences. So then to each crossing, I assign two differences. The upper difference, W plus, which is the difference where you put the crossing from left to right in its orientation and take the upper edge and take the difference of the labels zero minus two gives me a minus two and one minus minus one gives me two the upper label and the lower label are uh, the negatives of one another but it's a good idea to do them both if you're calculating by hand this is very easy to calculate by hand e e over at b i have two and minus two and at C, it's zero. If you check what will happen in a classical knot diagram, they'll all be zero. And the polynomial that I'm going to define will be trivial. But here it's not going to be so. Um, what we do is we take the sign of the crossing um, in the diagram, like this is a positive sign, and uh, take the sign of the crossing multiplied by a variable t raised to w sub sign of crossing so w plus if it's um if it's positive so this crossing is positive that crossing is positive and this one is negative so that means in reading the the powers of t that i get from here i'm going to get plus t to the minus two plus t squared and then minus t to the zero which is just minus one but the polynomial is compensated by taking the sum of those powers of t minus the writhe of the diagram. And so what that amounts to is those powers of t that are non, those powers where the exponent is not zero, plus an integer which adds all the coefficients up to zero because you're getting the sign for the signs from the powers, the, the coefficients of the t. So you can think of this polynomial as take the non-trivial powers of t that you can get, sign of crossing multiplied by t to somebody non-zero, then look at the sum of the coefficients and subtract it. And that's the polynomial. And that is invariant under right and Meister and virtual moves, right and Meister and detour moves. So again, uh, you can check that easily enough and I won't go bother you with the exercise, except as an exercise. But notice what not we have proved is non-trivial here. This is the original example of a knot with Jones polynomial equal to one. And we found that it has a non-trivial index polynomial and therefore, it's a non-trivial, non-classical knot, because if it were a class, if it were equivalent to a classical knot, it would have a zero index polynomial. So, uh, so this uh, this polynomial, which behaves quite differently from the bracket, 
is capable of, in, of indicating to us lots of examples of knots with unit Jones polynomial that are indeed non-classical. And, and this is a quite an interesting invariant. Uh, in fact, it is a concordance invariant. And you can begin to see that here because uh, if I were to examine the index polynomial for the sum of a knot and its mirror image, uh, then you see I get exactly a certain collection of powers here, but I'm going to be subtracting them uh, from the corresponding, in the corresponding part that is the mirror image. So, uh, so if a knot is the connected sum of itself and its mirror image, it's quite easy to just see directly that the polynomial will vanish. So I remind you of the definition of the polynomial again. You can think of it as the sum of the signs times t to the weight of the crossing minus one, which accomplishes a subtraction of the rive. And um, you might want to rewrite it um, uh, in other ways, but I won't bother you with that. So here is a variant that I think is interesting. I call this flat affine index polynomial. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it mod two as a polynomial. And I'm going to take the absolute values of the integral weights. You can then check that this is an invariant of flat knots and it's a concordance invariant of flat knots as well. So for example, I have this example, these two examples, um, which you could look at. I'm not going to bother you with them. However, the matter of the labeling is interesting because some things are just not labelable if you're looking at links. With knots, you can label everything, but with links, um, there are examples where you couldn't label it at all. So if you want to extend this invariant to links, then you have to think about it again because of the fact that there are cases where the links can't be labeled. So we could work with links that can be labeled. And uh, then you get an index invariant for links, even for classical links. So for example, here, uh, I have labeled uh, this hop link and we get the weights and we get the polynomial. And you'll notice that in this case, I have a difference. Um, I've taken some arbitrary weights here and I have the difference and the difference can be regarded as a variable and I get uh, uh, a polynomial like that. And, and that's an invariant of the link. It's detecting the linking number of the hop link in this case. And you can do it for virtual links as well. or for the Borromean rings and check that certain examples uh, such as this, virtual Borromean rings. This manages to uh, be linked uh, 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 because of the forbidden move. You see, if you, if you were allowed to move this uh, double crossing across this virtual crossing, it would come apart, but it's locked in there. And because it's locked in there, you can't seem to do anything underneath as well. You'd like to check that this is non-trivial. And indeed you can uh, using the bracket, uh, I mean, using the index evaluation. But before I go and prove that this is a concordance invariant, I wanted to take a little detour um, using my um, pad about the Alexander polynomial and the way it behaves under concordance. So let's see here.
Yeah. So there's a beautiful theorem about the Alexander polynomial due to Fox and Milner. And that, that theorem is that if K classical is concordant to K prime, which of course means that there is some genus zero embedding in R3 cross I, between k and k prime. Uh, if k is concordant to k prime, then, uh, then the Alexander polynomial of k prime is equal dot in the usual sense of up to plus or minus powers of t uh, to the Alexander polynomial of k multiplied by some polynomial f of t times f of t inverse. And in particular, if k is slice, then the Alexander polynomial of k is of the form f of t times f of t inverse. So that's worth mentioning, and since we're talking about cobordism of knots, uh, Alexander has that property, but we don't have exactly Alexander here, and we don't have the means to prove it either. We have some things that are analogs of Alexander, which I haven't talked about. But you might ask, uh, how do you know this result, and could you get it into skein theory? And that's my question. So let's consider what the question is like. You know that uh, you can also talk about the Conway polynomial, and the Conway polynomial is satisfies the simpler, one of the simpler skein relations without an extra variable. It satisfies this. Conway Alexander. And, and in fact, the Alexander polynomial in T is equal dot to the Conway evaluated at root t minus one over root t. So, the, so that tells you that if, for example, if k is slice, then the uh, Conway will be of the form f of some variable t times f of some variable t inverse. Uh, the same result will come over there with, with appropriate understanding of the variables. Uh, so Conway is entirely defined by this formula here and its invariance and the normalization to be equal to one on the unknot. And so you might wonder, well, maybe you could prove the Fox-Milner theorem uh, for uh, using just the skein. That's the question. That's the question. The question is, is there of the Fox-Milner theorem in the skein? And I don't know. I don't know how to do it, just using skein theory. The, the, way you, uh, the way you prove it using cipher, the, the, the usual proof or well-known proof uses the cipher pairing. And it's worth for background re remembering what the cipher pairing is, you have a surface F, who's not that function on the previous page, whose boundary is the knot, F is embedded in R3. And, and you have uh, a pairing 
on the first homology of F. by taking the linking number of one cycle pushed off the surface with the other. So for example, if If I had this surface and I had the two generating cycles in the homology here, this one and this one, then on the surface they intersect in a point. But if I were to push one up and the other one down a little bit and push one, then they either link or they don't link. So it's an asymmetric pairing. If I push one, if I push the left one up, it will not be linking the right one. But if I push the right one up, it will be linking the left one. I get an asymmetric pairing. And then it turns out, so for example, in this case, it will turn out to be uh, that uh, there's, um, um, a zero linking or one linking and then self linkings of probably minus one and minus one. I forget what whether it was one or minus one. No, it looks like it's plus one. So you would get that. You would get a very simple pairing like that. And then it turns out that uh, you can nicely represent the, uh, say, the Conway or the Alexander polynomial as the determinant of, uh, in this case, like that, if you want the Conway, where z is t minus t inverse, shifting my variables around. But that gives you Conway. The the thing about having the cipher pairing around is that you can you can do a little uh, analysis of what it means to be sliced and show that there is a half dimensional subspace of the module on uh, that we have here, the homology module, and on which the cipher pairing will vanish. And you can find it quite directly for some examples and, and indirectly by just analyzing what it means to be sliced. So you have all that three-dimensional, that little bit of three-dimensional topology available to you to prove the result. If that's behind your back, if you can't use it, uh, and you're only allowed to use the skein relation, then uh, it's not, at all clear how to prove this theorem. But if you could prove this theorem that way, then, then there might be some riches involved because then if you change to a different skein polynomial, instead of having a proof of the theorem, which will be false, you'll have some defect uh, and you will have some theorem about how knots behave for the Homfle polynomial on or or the uh, bracket polynomial under concordance that is very concrete. There are more indirect results about concordance in relation to the bracket polynomial, particularly by uh, using Kobanov homology. But but uh, but this is a kind of missing link in in my universe. I would like to see how to get a proof of the Fox-Milner theorem in the skein, so I thought I would mention that. Let's go back to work. We want to see what happens to this invariant, this index invariant under concordance. So if you have a concordance, then essentially it's composed of little elementary bits that are like this, where um, some you go through a saddle point and then somebody gets unhooked and uh, dies away, or vice versa, somebody is born and gets hooked into the link by a saddle point. You get trees of this kind of phenomenon going on uh, in a concordance, 
But if you look at the elementary bit here, then you can see what's going on. Because prior to the going through the saddle point, you have this component over here, which is in fact unlinked from the other one. And uh, all our work is invariant under the Reitermeister moves. And the contribution to the polynomial is the sum of the powers of t with, an, with some uh, 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 normalization uh, by an integer, uh, but I'll just call it the sum of the powers of t that's coming from this part and the sum of the powers of t that's coming from this part. But all of these things are invariant under Reitermeister moves. So as you pull this along, um, some things are going to cancel out and you will end up over here. So, uh, so you aren't going to, you, so the contribution from the part that went away is going to add up to nothing and won't contribute to the polynomial. And the only thing that you need in order to make this concrete is to have the numerical labeling in such a way that the label on this is equal to the label on this so that you can go through the saddle point without changing the labeling. And that can be arranged. And so it works. So uh, I've indicated an example here where uh, the labeling at the saddle point is zero. And so I just go through it. And then I find that uh, uh, this part here, which uh, has to be zero because it's going to go away, is uh, a piece of the polynomial that just is not contributing, uh, a sum of powers of t that is not contributing. And so the polynomial for this large thing is actually just equal to the polynomial for this piece, and it's invariant under concordance. Of course, there are there is one other sort of thing that you have to check, which is uh, this kind of um, inter interaction between uh, births and deaths like this, and that works out. And the general concordance, as I say, is a uh, kind of uh, composition of these elementary parts. So these are concordance invariants. And, uh, and this is in great contrast, as I said, to the case of the Alexander polynomial, where it, it really seems to be necessary to understand something uh, deeper topologically in order to get its concordance invariance. In the case of this index polynomial, the concordance invariance of it is lying out there on the surface, and yet it's still useful to have it around. So we have these invariants of concordance, and we can look at some examples. Um, here's an example. And you see that this idea of uh, working with the numbers gives rise to some concordance, some cobordisms that, uh, uh, that will give the same polynomial. You see, I, I, uh, I calculated this example, and I find that it's got a couple of places where I have zeros. Now, where I have zeros means that if I were to smooth away that crossing, the labeling would still be exactly the same. So I would have a labeled link that I could compute with. Um, and in that case, uh, I get the same polynomial that I had before. So what I get out of this is, I and I did it in the other uh, crossing as well. We did it here and we did it here. And I got this simpler link, uh, which has the same polynomial as the original. So in this case, uh, these are cobordisms that preserve the polynomial. It's not concordance anymore. It's just another, another thing that you can observe here that when you have zeros, then you have a cobordism from the virtual link over to somebody which has exactly the same polynomial by eliminating those crossings uh, because they don't contribute and you can still color. And so in this case, the Hoff link is sitting in back of the fact that this has a non-trivial polynomial.
Here's another example. In this example, um, I'm checking that it's non-trivial mod two. You needn't see all these examples. But the point about this example is that we've checked here that the flat one is non-trivial and the uh, non-flat one uh, where uh, I have chosen all the crossings to be positive. So I could take this guy and make all the crossings positive and then I will have, I see that I get a non-trivial polynomial. Now, you remember that I told you before that if you take a fully positive uh, virtual knot, then the four ball genus for that turns out to be equal to its virtual cipher genus, which is obtained by smoothing all of the crossings, all of the uh, crossings that are available to you to be smoothed in an oriented way, and then counting the cycles uh, and, and seeing what the genus is, because this is what you would get if you were to cap it off into the four ball. So you, you go through saddle points, one for each crossing, and um, and then you cap off the resulting collection of disks uh, with with disks the remaining collection of circles. So in this case, there's one Seifert circle, and the genus is one half of minus the number of Seifert circles plus the number of crossings plus one. It's three. So this has virtual four ball genus three. Okay. And in this case, we can compare the surface genus of the knot with the virtual four ball genus of the knot by going in a different direction. This is a question which is kind of hard in general to understand what the relationship should be. There's more than one genus of surface associated with a virtual knot. There is the uh, genus on which the virtual knot sits. And here I've indicated it with an abstract link diagram for this case where I have notified all the crossings because all the crossings were odd in this example. So forming the abstract link diagram, forming the surface on which the virtual knot sets is the same as doing it for this graph. Here it is. And I check the number of um, component boundaries in this case, and I get genus three again. But in general, there, there will be no um, no forced relationship between the genus on which the virtual knot sits and its four ball genus. There are two genuses and it would be nice to know if there was some relationship between them, but they really go in different directions. In this case, what I'm doing is just analyzing this example and I can analyze this example by using the, bra the Montura bracket and then I can see because of the graph having that genus, that the knot itself has that genus and find the minimal genus of the knot. Here's another example. I'm maybe too many examples, but uh, I think this is the last one I, I wanted to show you. In, in this case, I've taken the positive knot over here. Uh, and, uh, and so that one has four ball genus equal to its cipher genus, and we can calculate it. And then uh, I've also calculated the index polynomial. Now, then I switch one crossing, and I calculate the index polynomial again. Now it has one negative crossing right here. Uh, and so our theorem doesn't apply, and I'm wondering, well, what can I say about the genus of this? Well, I know it's uh, not slice. Um, because the polynomial ends up being non-trivial. So what can I say? Well, I can try out a little experiment. So I took this one and I went through a saddle point here 
Now, when I show you smoothing or crossing and say I went through a saddle point, what of course I meant was that I have the two oppositely oriented arcs near the crossing and I go through their saddle point and then there's a little Reitermeister one curl there and I just don't bother to draw it. So the result is every time you smooth a crossing, you go through a saddle point. You can think of it that way. So I went through a saddle point and then I found myself on another, now I have a link of two components and I found myself another saddle point to go through over here. And then I'm staring at this and I see that I can um, take a a trip that goes through these two crossings like that. And I can, if I wish, cut that out and connect these two across like that. And that's a perfectly good detour move. And then this goes over and that goes over. So there's a two move which uh, can be performed to pull this in. And then a one move and it goes away. So it bounds the surface of genus one. So on switching that crossing, this guy bounded the surface of genus one. And we know that it's non-trivial. And so uh, because we know that it's uh, not slice. So in this case, I can conclude the genus of this knot, even though it's not positive. So in some cases, I can find a little more about the genus of a knot by using the index polynomial. I don't know about deeper relationship between virtual genus and the index polynomial. It would be good to understand that better. Uh, that's the end of this line. But I wanted to tell you one more, I'll tell you about one more virtual invariant. And then after Joao, I'm going to go back and construct Kovana homology for virtual knots so that we can use it to, to prove some things that I have stated already. So let me tell you about one more polynomial invariant of virtual knots for a couple of minutes, and then we'll stop. This invariant. Um, um, Heather Dye and, and myself call the arrow polynomial. And um, it, is, it ends up being equivalent to a, to a polynomial that evolved under the hands of Naoko Kamada And uh, I forgot his first name, Miyazawa. That they, well, let's just call it the Miyazawa polynomial. We were confused about the relationship for a while, partly because we were evolving this from one angle and they were evolving it from another and they had a series of papers, but it ended up in the end, the simplest version ends up being the same. Um, and the idea from our point of view is very simple. The idea is the following. Suppose that you look at the oriented bracket. Well, then you seem to get something that you wouldn't like to have around. You get an expansion that looks like this, A times smoothing it, and A inverse times smoothing it in a, in a peculiarly oriented way like this. You would need to uh, articulate a couple of nodes in there like that. And so you can ask the question, can we carry this extra structure all the way 
through the states. Good question, right? Um, maybe you could, uh, in which case the states would have some extra funny bits of combinatorics on them, and maybe that would be a good thing. So, so you analyze, you, you do the proof again, do the invariance proof. And since we're near the end of the time, I think I won't go through the details. I'll just tell you the result. And, and when I come back on uh, in a couple of weeks, we could look at this if we wanted to. The result is that everything is OK if you reduce via cancellation of these little cusps in pairs on the same side of the line. Now, of course, that doesn't depend on the order. Uh, could be the other order, go out and then in, or in and then out. But, but these, of course, both go in, and these both go out, and they're on the same side of the line. Cusps can be on the opposite side of the line, and we don't need to cancel them. This is a zigzag in my terminology. And this survives. So that's where this exercise of doing the invariance proof is quite interesting because you go through it and you find out, oh, the zigzags survive. You don't have to throw them away. They don't disturb the invariance under the Reitermeister moves. And so that means that that means that you can have states, you can have state loops that are a standard type state loops like this, but you can also have state loops that look like this. I'll stop drawing the arrows. Or you can have state loops that have two zigzags. and so on. So you can have ordinary state loop with its ordinary evaluation, then you can have what we call the K1 and the K2, and so on, where I count the number of zigzags. And those become extra variables. They are independent entities, and, uh, and they are the residue of working out the bracket to the bitter end. And everything else about this oriented bracket works the same way as the usual one. Now, you might say, well, does that mean that I'm going to get uh, a new highly variable Jones polynomial for classical knots? And the answer to that is no. Nope. Uh, the reason being that if you had such a thing happening in a classical knot, well, remember that these uh, cusps always come in pairs to begin with. We're working from a classical knot. They come in pairs. So this must be paired with somebody somewhere in its lifetime. And, um, and this then would mean that there would be yet another zigzag over here, but then that would have to be paired with somebody. And none of these loops can intersect one another, so you'll get an infinite descent that you can't fulfill if you're in the plane. But if you're not in the plane, then of course it's perfectly possible to have uh, some geometry of cusps like this. We can draw an example easily enough on the torus. Here is a zigzag. And here is somebody with no zigzag, but fitting into it like that. And this happened because this is on one side and the other. The curves still have local sides, but this is on one side 
and this is on the other, and everything is fulfilled out here on the Taurus, and and so uh, in the expansion of a link that you drew corresponding to this picture that I just drew, you would find a K1 in that link. Um, so then if you go back to some examples that you're interested in, such as this one, you can then ask, well, what will happen if we use the arrow polynomial on this uh, kind of thing rather than the Jones polynomial? We know that the Jones polynomial cut out here, it went away. Uh, so what will happen here? Let's take a look. Pardon me for killing these pictures. Um, so I'm concerned with this situation and what is going to happen to it if we were doing an arrow polynomial expansion. Well, then this will expand to A times this plus A inverse. Times that. And of course, this part here is indeed equivalent to smoothing it out, but this can be non trivial. It can happen that these cusps are parts of zigzags and will survive all the way to the end of the polynomial and you will get a non-trivial polynomial, even though the Jones polynomial was trivial. And such is indeed the case for, uh, for the kind of the, this example, which you can try out as an exercise. So you will find that if you were to calculate the arrow polynomial for this, that it will imply that it's non-classical. That calculation is a little harder than the one for the index polynomial, but shows how this survival of zigzags uh, in, in the thing uh, works. So the arrow polynomial is quite interesting to look at for various reasons, uh, and, um, and it is a natural kind of successor to the Jones polynomial because it, can, it is, getting an invariant out of the Jones polynomial situation by taking into account a little bit of the extra structure that's available from oriented link. Of course, as I said, it can happen uh, that you are working with some link which is living on a surface. And then you can combine these techniques for working with various examples. So for example, here, um, if I were on the surface and working with this, then I could examine the uh, arrow polynomial for this on the surface, just as we've examined the Jones polynomial on the surface. And then I would be keeping track of the isotopy classes of the state loops, including their cusp structure and uh, using it to examine what goes on. Uh, there is a nice result about the relationship between the number of virtual crossings and the uh, Ki degrees. The Ki degrees, by which I mean you might have, for example, K1, K2 to the fourth, in which case you would be looking at a Ki degree of one plus two times four, nine. 
um, the KI degrees, the highest KI degree, is a lower bound on the number of virtual crossings in the diagram. So there is a relationship with the number of virtual crossings in the diagram with the arrow polynomial, and there are some relationships with genus. But I don't know very much about how the arrow polynomial is related to cobordism. So let's just put that as a question. Arrow polynomial relate to cobordism. Question mark. How is the arrow polynomial related to not to link cobordism of virtual knots? I don't know so much about that. I don't know anything about that. So that's a good place to stop. And we'll hear from Joe next week. Oh, wow. thank you, Lou. That's fascinating. Thanks, Lou. Arrow polynomial. Thank um, you. Thank you. Any questions? I have a couple of questions, Roger. Uh, ask Lou. If I may. Well, <laughs> I don't want to jump in, but I do have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Good, yeah. Lou, can we go right back to the beginning where you talked about the parity bracket, please? Um, and you described these graphical nodes that you get having reduced the uh, the state. So you've notified odd crossings, you've carried out a reduction of Rydermeister 2 configurations, and you end up with what you described as a graphical node. I think you can regard that graphical node as a minimal virtual doodle if you consider the nodes as sort of flat crossings. Would you say that was correct? Because you have no Rydermeister 1 loops around any of these nodes because they're odd and not even and you have reduced and i'm not allowing a third rhinomeister move right. that's right so yeah so uh, maybe a good idea is to take the doodle equivalence class of uh, of the graph yeah well what makes it interesting from a computing perspective is that minimal virtual doodles have a unique representation so that you can compute the parity bracket polynomial by comparing uh, minimal representations of these doodles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, that's something that I'm, I'm interested in at the moment. So are you saying that you have tabulated minimal doodles? Uh, we have tabulated minimal doodles. We did that mm -hmm. with um, Kamada. So we have, yeah, we have some tables of minimal doodles. Um, but I'm, my interest at the moment is really because of the representation, you know, the unique representation you have of minimal doodles. But it's interesting to see that what you end up with, with the parity bracket, is this thing that is very similar to a minimal doodle sitting within the knot. And I was interested to hear your comments about your Cushino graph being somehow uh, characteristic of any diagram. And so it'd be, I think that'd be something to follow up on. Um, so that's, that's one thing. The, the other thing about parity is that um, in Manturov's paper, he defines a separate parity for two component links, which is different to the notion of parity that you've defined for knots. And it doesn't extend to three component links. And just a, a, an odd thought that I had the other day is whether or not maybe there's a way of having some consistent notion of parity across arbitrary links using the idea of, of the fact that there's a doodle sitting in there. I don't know whether that's... Uh, uh, maybe, maybe there is. I, I think I might have missed this discussion of his about parity for links. Can you send me an email pointing to where that is and which paper of his? Yes, it's in the parity in knots, the one that's in Russian that's translated into English. And the, the parity uh -huh. two component links. The parity project. You're talking about the parity projection paper. Uh, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll drop you an email and send. Uh, you there are a lot of Montura papers. So yeah, if yeah, you yeah. point to the, <laughs> cool. the, the place, I'll, I'll look. Sure. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, all right. Um, so yeah, that were my two questions. Thank you. Thank you. So well, um, I've just got a, an observation, um, Lou. When you were talking about, you know, you've got this infinite sequence of um, of what were they? Some kind of infinite sequence of very odd Gauss diagrams. Yeah. There's, there's a there's a kind of massy product there. I mean, uh, I don't know. Uh, just a <laughs> just a hunch. Uh, but what what do you mean, uh, massy product? I, I well, think of massy know, product as well. The linking numbers is, go, but something else will be able yeah, to be. Yeah, you know, if something measure. is zero, and then you you but you get another crossing, and that uh, or you know, similar to similar to a, 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 a you know a Milner number or something I don't know. could be uh, yeah. I don't know just a just a vague observation but uh, maybe maybe useful maybe not <laughs> anyway um, are there any more questions Okay, well, I'll end things here. And let's see, on Friday, uh, we've got Scott. Yep. Do you want to say anything, Scott? Uh, I'll be uh, telling you about a fairly classical theorem. It's uh, been known since the time of the cabordism hypothesis, but the way that it's formulated allows us to see, uh, a bunch of other um, relations among handle cancellations and so forth. Um, and of course, the talk will be replete with pictures. I would like to check um, if everybody can hear me now, because I'll probably use this configuration. Loud and clear. Okay, yeah, good. Very clear. Okay. I have problems with my other headphones and the microphone on that. Um, so if you... If you can't hear, say now or forever hold thy peace. And I'll send um, the uh, slides to Roger and or Lou, um, mm -hmm. uh, either as a keynote or some other format. Um, yeah, beforehand. Okay. So, yeah. And of course, uh, if anybody else wants to give a talk, um contact me or Lou. Um that would be great. Okay, I'm going to stop things now. Bye, see you Bye -bye. Friday. Bye-bye. Thank you, Roger. Bye. -bye.